professor at Brigham Young University. He is an accomplished and productive Egyptologist. And those two words together are significant. And we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Gee here to speak with us today about Edfu and Exodus. Thank you. Um, Matthew Brown wrote a, many books on a variety of topics, but one topic that held his interest and to which he kept returning was the temple. He invited me to give this paper only a couple of days before his untimely passing. It was the last time I saw him. The first Israelite temple was the portable temple of the Israelites uh, in the wilderness, better known as the tabernacle, whose description is provided in the book of Exodus. This description begins in the 25th chapter and runs through the 28th chapter. It describes first the Ark of the Covenant, a portable shrine carried on staves by priests, followed by the table for the showbread, the lampstand, <coughs> the curtains and their coverings, swallow the microphone, the boards, the veil, and the arrangement of the Holy of Holies. Next, the altar is described in the courtyard, and finally, the garments of the priests are described. A number of the features of the descriptions of the tabernacle compare with Egypt. These include gilded wooden frames socketed together and covered with curtains, which was based directly on long-established Egyptian technology, shown here, here uh, from the age of the pyramids. It occupied the center of the rectangular camp of the Hebrew tribal groups, and this compares directly with the war tent of Ramses II within, within its shield palisaded rectangular camp. The Ark of the Covenant was a gilded box carried upon removable gilded poles, and this is specifically Egyptian usage. Egyptian sacred bark shrines were also carried on such poles by priests in a procession. The Hebrew term for acacia wood out of which the tabernacle was constructed is a loan word from Egyptian, as is the technique for overlaying that wood with metal. The term for linen used in the construction of the tabernacle is likewise an Egyptian loan word, and the leather used in the tabernacle's construction might also be an Egyptian loan word. The incense dish mentioned in the description of the tabernacle is hand derived from the hand-shaped incense cup depicted, depicted in Egypt. And three of the measures, the hen, the ephah, and the amar, all come from Egypt. This, however, is not the extent of the comparisons that can be made with Egypt. Now, the ancient temple has a long history. Temple studies have been going on for a number of years, but those doing temple st studies no normally overlook the Egyptian evidence. Egypt has more than 150 temples, providing a large number of archaeological remains. Many of these temples are also filled with inscriptions. Additionally, a number of papyri from temple archives have been recovered. Among the, the papyri recovered are a number of copies of work, still unpublished, called by its editor, the Book of the Temple, because it deals with the layout of the temple and the work of the priests. It exists in hieroglyphic, hieratic, demotic, and Greek versions from all over Egypt and in multiple manuscripts, 20 from Teb Tunis alone. Most of the manuscripts date from the Roman period, but the text goes back earlier, although its editor, Joachim Kvach, has demurred to say how much further back it goes. At least one of the manuscripts we shall see dates from the Ptolemaic period. While most of these manuscripts were unpublished, a couple of versions have been published, and one of these, adapted from the so-called Book of the Temple, is the Bandeau inscription of the Temple of Edfu. The Edfu Bandeau inscription contains a historical prologue, this is Edfu, um, introducing the building of the temple followed by a description of the temple, room by room. As Dieter Kurt has noted, the ancient text makes an excellent guidebook to the Egyptian temple, the description is planned, accurate, detailed, and complete. Um, never tells us as much as we want, though. If we allow ourselves to be guided through the temple by the author of this inscription, we shall see the building with the eyes of a competent contemporary. A parallel also exists for the Dendera temple, but an overarching study of all Bando inscriptions of the late temples does not yet e exist. But some general patterns have been, have been discussed, and I've used the description from Edfu because it's fuller than Dendera inscription and provides more detail about the rooms and what they are used for. 
The Edfu inscription describes the temple, and you can see it here and follow along if you wish. <laughs> These monuments which his majesty and fathers made are the image of the heavenly temple and says that the inscription will contain a knowledge of their chapels, a report of their halls, an account of their measurements and their columns, a revelation of their doorways, a list of their stairways, a report of the number of their upper chambers, and all our knowledge of their gates and the doors in them to every place onto which they open, an account of their walls perfectly decorated by master craftsmen of the House of Life, which has been argued to be the temple scriptorium where books are connected with religion and cognate matters were compiled. The structure of the Edvu Bando inscriptions began first with a historical introduction describing how the temple was begun under the reign of Ptolemy III of Ergetes and finally finished under the reign of Ptolemy X Alexander I. The temple was planned out by Ptolemy III together, himself together with the god Seshat, or goddess Seshat. The correct position of the temple was given by divine decree and primor the primordial gods rejoiced while circumambulating it. The sanctuary was comp completed 25 late years later under Ptolemy IV Phila uh, Philopater. That's him. After the, 16 year, after the 16th year of Ptolemy IV, quote, the curse of rebellion occurred after the ignorant rebelled in the south and work ceased on the throne of the gods. This condition lasted until the 19th year of the reign of Ptolemy V when construction resumes. This rebellion under Haranofres and Haranofres is mentioned in the Rosetta Stone. It doesn't show up very well, does it? As interesting as the historical portion of the inscription is, the description of the temple is our primary focus here. It begins with a description of the Holy of the Holies called the Emsun. The Emsun is in its midst, the first chapel, the great seat of the god. Its length is eight and a third cubits. Its width is five and two-thirds cubits. Its walls are inscribed with the council of the gods of the Emsun and their images. The inscription then describes other chapels coming off the hall. So, there we go. Surrounding the bark shrine, starting to the right of the Emsun and continuing on through those on the right-hand side and then going to the left of the Emsun and following through the left-hand side. All these chapels, nine in total, open out onto the hall that encircles the Bark Shrine. These shrines belong to the Aeneid of the Gnome, that is, the Council of the Gods that belong to that region. The Bark Shrine, or Great Seat, is in their midst surrounding it, 19 and 5 sixths by 10 and 1 third cubits. The Ark, a portable shrine, oh, you can't see that at all, that's too bad, shaped like a boat and carried on staves by priests resided here. The rituals of the Lord are his, the revelation of the face of God, offering righteousness to its creator and burning incense for the ark. Now the first of these rituals, the revelation of the face of God, is part of a series of rituals that are found on alternating, alternating first registers of the interior walls of the great seat. These include, um, with depictions here borrowed from Karnak, Mounting the steps, drawing back the bolt, unloosing the seal, revealing the face of God, seeing God, and praising God four times. This could be abbreviated simply as seeing God and is equated with worship. The offering of righteousness, here again borrowed from Karnak, is also explicitly given three times in the great seat. The offering of righteousness is thought by, mo of, by modern scholars as an archetypal offering a supreme offering into which all other offerings are subsumed. It, it occurs both in royal and private settings and in both temporal and funerary context. The purpose of this offering is to grant salvation to the offerer. The fumigation of the ark, ark transfigures it, preparing it for the manifestation of the God. And the great seat has a simple incense offering coupled with a depiction of doing so in front of the ark. Proceeding with the description of the Temple of Edfu, the Bandeau inscription records, the central hall is in front of it, referring to the great, great seat. It is 20 cubits by nine cubits. The shrines of the gods are in it. Off to one side is a shrine for the god Min, and the other is the food altar. And there's an open air court off this room. I'm really sorry these aren't showing up very well. 
called the Wabbit or Pure Place. Ointment, clothing, and protective amulets are provide, offered to provide the god with his regalia after his majesty is purified with his soap and water jars so that his spirit may unite with his image. This description from the Bandeau inscription, or description from the Bandeau inscription, matches that of a modern scholar who carefully analyzed the inscriptions from the pure, inside the Pure Place. The central themes of the rites performed in the Wabbit are the purification and distancing of the statues of the gods, their clothing with linen, anointment, and adornment with protective insignia and royal regalia. The ritual activities performed within and depicted and described on the walls of the Wabbit show a strong resemblance to a number of other rituals. These rituals can be observed in the temple, the daily temple ritual, in the funerary sphere, the ritual of the opening in the mouth, and even the embalming ritual, and also the royal sphere and the confirmation of the, pharaoh, uh, of the pharaoh in his power. The preparation consists in the purification, clothing with linen, anointing and provision with uh, protective amulets and food offerings to the statues of these gods. These activities are followed by the presentation of items characteristics of the theology of the temple and its central deity. So the distinction scholars make between temple rituals and funerary rites is not self-evident, especially with regards to the rites performed in Ptolemaic and Roman temples. The front of the central hall, or in front of the central hall, is the offering hall. It is decorated on its faith with the rites of the divine rite and all the instructions pertaining thereto. The divine rite, as we know from a ritual role in Berlin, shown here, is the daily temple ritual. The rituals of this papyrus in Berlin are broken into two parts, rites for entering the sanctuary and seeing the god, and offerings made to the god. The inscriptions on the wall pertain to the uh, offerings portion of the divine rite. The Berlin papyri seem to only have the first portion of this second part. Some of the middle is missing, but the end is contained in a papyrus in Turin and Cairo. Thus we have depicted rich, uh, um, depicted rituals for such things as rattling sistra, offering wine, offering a clock, uh, offering an offering table, listing the offerings, images of God, joints of meat, milk, offering beer, offering other alcoholic beverages, and so on. The Bandeau inscription continues, the great hall is in front of it with 12 pillars, great supports, beautiful in appearance. It is 37 cubits long and 15 cubits wide. It is called the chamber of happiness. It is like a papyrus thicket. Off this room are chambers dedicated to washing, anointing, whitening clothing, and adorning with amulets. The fore hall comes after it. It is higher, oh, nice picture. It is higher than these and larger than them. It contains 18 beautiful columns. This hall, which is in front of the fore hall, is larger than it and measures 90 cubits on the south to north and 80 cubits from west to east. 32 columns surround it in its circuit like a falcon's nest. Its name is Place of Overthrowing the Servant, the Enemy of the Sun God. And that's the picture. And a pylon stands in front of them, which is 120 cubits long, 60 cubits high to their head, and 21 cubits in thickness. They have been decorated with inscriptions on all the instructions of, them, of opposing foreigners. Two obelisks stand in front of them, no longer there, to penetrate the clouds of heaven. These obelisks provide an Egyptian analog for the pillars, Yachin and Boaz, that were found in Solomon's temple. Exodus and Edfu are similar in many ways. They both start with a historical introduction that provide a description of the temple. Like the Edfu Bando inscription, the book of Exodus begins with a historical prologue. This story is well known and richly commemorated in the Passover festival. They both start from the sanctuary and work out. They are both concerned with measurements. They differ in that the Edfu inscription concentrates on the room, while Exodus concentrates on the furniture. Because the Edfu inscription is based on the so-called Book of the Temple, the text dates, as er, text back, dates back as early as the Book of the Temple, but how early is that? Well, the Edfu provides the date of the manuscript of the Book of the Temple to the reign of Ptolemy X, Alexander I, and the pattern of the temple, which the inscription follows, was laid out under Ptolemy III, Oergetes. 
How far earlier can this be traced? Although manuscripts of the text are lacking, we can see how far back the elements of the text go by looking at temples to see if they follow the general architectural layout specified in the Book of the Temple and whether their decorations matches that given. It is, of course, easier to specify this research program than to actually carry it out. So we'll look at temples that are founded and going back in time from Edfu, which was founded under Ptolemy the Third of Argetes, and compare them with the inscription. Well, there was a new temple of men at Coptos under Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, but unfortunately, nothing remains of the new temple except a few parts of the high temple platform and two parallel staircases. Ptolemy II also founded a temple at Theodelphia, but it is now completely destroyed. Ptolemy I built a temple at uh, Ternutus, which was found destroyed down to the foundation trenches. Ptolemy also built a new temple at Teptunus. This is the temple whose sellers provided the Teptunus Temple Archive, mostly 2nd century AD papyri containing religious, scientific, literary, administrative, and, and private texts in Hieratic, Demotic, and Greek to do with the temple and its priests, including 20 different manuscripts of the so-called Book of the Temple. Surely we should expect this temple to follow the same pattern, and it probably did. Surface fragments where the temple once stood show that it had been, been built of stone and decorated with painted reliefs, but only the mud brick foundations survive. We can probably date the so-called Book of the Temple back to at least the reign of Ptolemy I. In the earlier Persian period in Egypt, we have some difficulties. The initial 120-year Persian domination left minimal traces in Egyptian architecture and even the number of stele, stone sarcophagi, and, and other monuments in Egyptian style decreased significantly. In the later period, Persian period, there was some building, and most Persian period pharaohs extended or lar enlarged previous buildings. However, next to Nebo II began construction of a temple for Isis and Osiris at Bechbet el -Hagar. The temple has collapsed, its tum tumbled blocks cover an, 80, an area 80 meters long and 50 to 60 meters wide. It may have been destroyed by a strong earthquake in antiquity, and ongoing stone robbing has reduced the pile considerably. Nectanebo also seems to have begun a major temple at Sabinitos because there were about 40 inscribed blocks at the site in 1911, but no official excavation of the site is recorded. For Sayite times, previous to the Persian period, the Ammonian of the Seaway Oasis was built under the reign of Amasis, and besides the Hibis Temple and the El Cargo Oasis, it is the only standing temple of the 26th dynasty. It is a smaller temple, about 15 by 52 meters, and incompletely published. Symmetricus II built the Hibis Temple and the Cargo Oasis, which is a small temple missing many of the elements in the larger temples like Edfu. In Kushite times, Taharqa built three very similar temples at Tabo, Kawa, and Sanam, and it would appear that the Hippus Temple in Karga is based on these. The organization of these temples discloses that only minor details have changed in temple buildings since the New Kingdom, and that older plans and decoration programs were purposely followed. This indicates that the temples followed the set plan. You can see them here. And the so-called Book of the Temple may not have existed in its form in Edfu, but something like it existed. This brings us to the New Kingdom Temple of Medina Tabu. Similar in shape to the Edfu Temple, its interior rooms, particularly around the area of Holy of Holies, is quite different from Edfu. For example, at Edfu, the Hall of the Aeneid does not surround a central bark shrine. Oh, no, at Medina Habu, the Edfu, the Hall of the Aeneid, which is over here in the circle, um, doesn't surround the Bark Shrine as it does in Edfu, but is set to the left of the Holy of Holies. Nevertheless, the temple has the pylon, the open court, and the multiple, multiple hypostyle halls. Much of the rear of the temple is destroyed, including most of the innermost hypostyle hall, so we cannot compare the decoration. The pylon, however, is decorated precisely as laid out in the Edfu Temple. I'll go, well, I guess we can't, won't go back there so you can't see it. Um, with, with its scenes of Pharaoh smiting the enemies, it has been decor decorated with the inscriptions of all the instruction of opposing foreigners. And this motif is continued around the sides of the temple with the inscriptions describing Ramses III's triumph against foreign enemies. 
So that portion of the so-called Book of the Temple seems to go back to the New Kingdom. Furthermore, it has been noted that the ritual in the various temples is similar, if not identical, to each other. The contents of the rituals is not necessarily adapted to the individual deities and sometimes is not connected with the gods whose, uh, whose the rituals are used to worship. So there's clearly something like the Book of the Temple that goes back to the New Kingdom. It standardized temples' forms, functions, and decorations. This means that there may have been some connection between an early form of the Book of the Temple and the Book of Exodus. Both start with a historical prologue followed by a description of the temple. Both follow a similar format, describing the temple from the inside out. Both are concerned with the dimensions of the sacred space. One can make a plausible, although hardly demonstrable case, that both the Edfu Bandeau inscription and the Book of Exodus were influenced by an er earlier version of the so-called Book of the Temple. Now there might be a stronger case to be made, but that will have to wait until the complete publication of the Book of the Temple. And I am certain that Matt Brown would have loved to read it. I am out of time. All right.